is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we continue coverage of problems with uranium and possibly other radionuclide contamination in the central U.S. Ogallala Aquifer with an interview with investigative journalist Paul DiRienzo. And that interview was a wild ride. More information and more wide-ranging than I possibly could have anticipated. There's tremendous information about long-standing problems at waste control specialists in Andrews, Texas, in the Texas Panhandle, and insights ranging from the building of Three Mile Island to Hanford Waste Storage to... Well, you're going to have to listen. Because this is one of the most evocative interviews I've experienced in all four years of Nuclear Hot Seat. We'll also receive our seventh lesson on social media super tricks. Weekly quick tips on how to get the most out of your anti-nuclear online presence. Once again with the irrepressible Dave Parrish of Operation Save the Earth. This week, why we all must get over our fears of Google+. And there will be a progress report on the fix of the NuclearHotSeat.com website. Yes, progress. It's being made. I'll tell you all about it. All that and our regular numbnuts of the week, activist shoutouts, and more nuclear information than every Kardashian in the world combined has ever heard. All of which will be coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, September 1st, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Last week, Nuclear Hot Seat reported on a study just issued by the University of Nebraska, which examined EPA and USGS data on over 275,000 water samples from 62,000 sites in the central and western United States. It found uranium contamination at levels 89 times the EPA maximum contaminant levels in two major aquifers in the central U.S. that provide drinking water for 6 million people as well as 40% of the water used to irrigate the crops in eight states. Additionally, aquifers in California's Central Valley, our breadbasket, showed concentrations at 180 times the uranium contamination allowed by EPA maximum standards. The cause was linked to nitrate fertilizer use that made uranium existing in the environment water-soluble. But there are other nuclear sites adjacent to the aquifers that are highly suspect, and an article has just come out enumerating problems at one of them, Waste Control Specialists, or WCS, in Andrews, Texas. This is the site that has been receiving the waste that was supposed to go to the waste isolation pilot plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, that has been closed for over a year and a half now because of an explosion involving nuclear materials. Among the issues at WCS, burying radioactive waste from nuclear power plants from 36 states in a hole that environmentalists say is atop the Ogallala Aquifer, the second largest in the world as well as political manipulations and intimidation tactics that got the waste repository permitted in the first place. An article has just been published on the website whowhatwhy.org by investigative journalist Paul DiLorenzo that goes into the details about WCS, and we will be speaking with Paul in detail during today's featured interview. Fukushima nuclear waste has again been detected along the Southern California coast. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's Center for Marine and Environmental Radiation last week released test results from a water sample taken on April 4, 2015, just over a mile off the coast of Del Mar in California. That's located about 15 miles north of San Diego and 100 miles south of Los Angeles. Both cesium-134 and 137, the fingerprints of the Fukushima accident, were found in the sample that had 8.4 becquerels per cubic meter of salt water. Results for other Fukushima Daiichi-derived radionuclides were not posted. According to Woods Hole scientist Ken Busler, as the plume begins to arrive along the west coast, it will actually increase in concentration. 
No public agency in the U.S. is monitoring the activities in the Pacific without careful, extensive, consistent monitoring. We'll have no way of knowing how much radiation from Fukushima is reaching our shores and how it could affect life in the ocean. What Buesler does not mention is that life in the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, has been dying at a shocking rate and that radiation from Fukushima was found in the kelp and in the fish less than one year after the emergency began. No word as to how these earlier measurements or the catastrophic die-offs in the ocean are being factored into the Woods Hole measurements. In a related story, of 46 recently weaned northern elephant seal deaths reported by the San Francisco Bay Area's Marine Mammal Center between April 20th and August 1st of this year, a leukemia-linked disorder was listed as the cause of death in 16 of them, over one-third of the total. The disorder, referred to as DIC, does not occur by itself, but only as a complicated factor from another underlying condition, usually in those with a critical illness, and frequently in those with acute promyelocystic leukemia. In humans, leukemia is known to frequently be caused by exposure to radiation and usually shows up within three to five years of exposure. It has been four years since Fukushima, and this is now showing up in the seals. Up to Washington State, where, according to a leaked internal report, a nearly completed government facility at the Hanford site, intended to treat the radioactive byproducts of nuclear weapons production, is riddled with design flaws that could put the entire operation at risk of failure. A technical review of the treatment plant identified hundreds of quote-unquote design vulnerabilities and other weaknesses, some serious enough to lead to spills of radioactive material. Hanford, in eastern Washington state, is where much of the nation's plutonium stockpile originated. It's also where millions of gallons of high-level radioactive waste are stored, much of it in leaky underground tanks. And with all of the problems, the plant is regarded as one of Hanford's most successful projects. And yes, given that that is Hanford, that is what passes for success. A Sacramento, California Superior Court has denied Boeing's motion for a summary judgment in a lawsuit over demolition and disposal of radioactively contaminated structures from the site of a partial nuclear meltdown near Los Angeles. Boeing had claimed that the California Department of Toxic Substances Control has no regulatory authority over the demolition and disposal of radioactively contaminated structures in the nuclear portion of the Santa Susana Field Lab in Simi Hills, which is 30 miles from downtown Los Angeles and not far away from my neighborhood. The lab had tested small-scale nuclear reactors, rocket engines, and fuels and suffered a partial meltdown in 1959 that not only has never fully been cleaned up, but was not publicly revealed until after an investigation after Three Mile Island happened in 1979. So Boeing, no fox in charge of the hen house rulings for you. Another sign that Three Mile Island's nuclear facility may be heading towards shutdown and that is that at a key energy buying auction held by PJM, which is a regional transmission organization that coordinates the movement of power in all our parts of 13 states and the District of Columbia, nobody bought any of TMI's electricity. It's got the cooties. As a result, there is rampant speculation that Exelon may be considering closing TMI as it is also considering closing three of its nuclear facilities in Illinois. hoo And a story by our movement's esteemed Eminence Gris, Carl Grossman, which appeared in TheEcologist.org. Boeing Company last week received approval from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office for an airplane engine that combines the use of lasers and nuclear power. This is numbnuts adjacent. Read Carl's article. It's in theecologist.org under Nuclear Powered Aircraft. Nice idea, Boeing. And now for the real one. Nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. 
Nuclear hot seed, num nuts of the week. This time it's num nuts plus the duck and cover report because the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, has rejected. The recommendations of its own high-level task force, the one that it convened after the March 11, 2011 Fukushima disaster began, their recommendation to require nuclear plant owners to develop and maintain plans for coping with a core melt accident. That's right. The NRC is saying, eh, don't worry about it. You don't have to make any plans. This decision is going to allow nuclear plants to continue to operate those plans voluntarily and deny the agency the authority to review those plans or issue citations if they are deficient. That's right, the fox is in charge of the hen house, and the unsupervised inmates are running the asylum. According to Edward Lyman, a senior scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists, once again, the NRC is ignoring a key lesson of the Fukushima accident. Emergency plans are not worth the paper they are printed on unless they are rigorously developed, maintained, and periodically exercised. When it comes to these critical safety measures, the NRC is allowing the industry to regulate itself. The nuclear industry, led by its premier trade organization and slime mold, the Nuclear Energy Institute, NEI, opposed the proposal arguing that the proposal did not meet a strict cost-benefit standard. That's right. It costs too much to make plans and maintain them in case of a core melt, so eh, whatever. The odds are that it won't happen, so we don't really need to take care of it. And thus, rejecting its own staff's recommendations, the NRC commissioners voted in favor of the industry and against the public interest. Obviously, they've never heard the axiom of emergency preparedness, hope for the best, and plan for the worst. In this case, the worst is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which once again is this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, Num Nuts of the Week. Over to Japan, where radiation fears are growing as the government finds strangely deformed trees around Fukushima. The study shows that 98% of fir trees in a 3.5-kilometer or 2-mile area from the damaged facility have defects, including a splitting of the trunk of the tree into two parts and the lack of a tip, without which it cannot continue to grow. Shioya in Tochigi Prefecture is about 164 kilometers or 100 miles from Fukushima, and last Saturday, August 29, about 2,700 residents of the town, in an ultimate demonstration of NIMBY, not in my backyard, demonstrated to oppose the central government's choice of their town as a candidate site for the final disposal of some of the radiation-tainted waste resulting from the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster. The residents adopted a resolution urging the plan to be scrapped, because the waste that is meant to be sent to them contains more than 8,000 becquerels of radioactive cesium per kilogram. In 2012, another city in Tochigi Prefecture, Yaita, was selected as a candidate site for final waste disposal, but the government was later forced to reconsider the decision due to fierce local opposition. Sounds like it's happening all over again. We'll have our featured interview in just a few moments, but first... The Nuclear Hot Seat website is in the process of rising from the digital ashes after its takedown a month ago. Oh my gosh, it's been a month. I've been promised a test version of the website to review later this week, and if it passes muster, we'll then get into the process of reloading all 219 episodes along with the supporting materials. To those of you who have already donated to the Nuclear Hot Seat website fix fund, I am tremendously grateful. We couldn't have gotten started without you. Work was begun with payment promised, but not completely in hand. We just put a down payment on it. As of now, we have raised close to three quarters of the funds necessary for this improved, more functional, and completely enclosed in a nuclear containment worthy vessel strength security site, so we never have to go through this problem again. Until the website is up, there's still an emergency landing page at 
NuclearHotSeat.com, where you can access download weeks for the last few weeks of shows. That's where you will also find a secure link. We made sure it was absolutely secure to be able to make a donation, either through PayPal or directly from your credit or debit card. As I said, we are almost three-quarters of the way to being able to pay for this website fix, so your donation is still needed to get us over the top. If you've ever thought of donating to Nuclear Hot Seat, don't wait for the end of the year. Now, right now, is the perfect time. Any amount is appreciated, and no amount is insignificant. Every donation, no matter the size, is a sign of your caring about the show, and it helps keep it and me going. Please, don't wait. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com to find the secure donate link. If you prefer not to donate online, you can email me for a snail mail address to send your donation. Know that I really am deeply touched, not only by the generosity of you, the listeners, but the notes of support that I have received during this time have been truly touching. They have moved me. So again, go to the truncated but still functional NuclearHotSeat.com website and whatever you can do to help, thank you. Sometimes I get lucky, and an interview surprises me in a good way, as this one surely did. I spoke with investigative journalist Paul DiRienzo, intending to focus on his recent, at that point not yet published, but it has been now, his recent story regarding the Waste Control Specialist site in Andrews, Texas, which I cited earlier in this program. What I did not expect was the direction or the many directions that the interview took from the start, how it galloped off to reveal a wealth of unexpected historical information on the nuclear industry, specific build sites, and all kinds of other manipulations. Now, you're going to hear me struggling on more than one occasion to get the interview back on track until I realized that what was coming forth was much better than anything I could have anticipated or imagined. And so I just let the thing ride as I surrendered to the informational force of nature that is Paul DiRienzo. So fasten your seatbelts because it is going to be an amazing ride. Paul DiRienzo, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. First of all, give us a sense of your background as an investigative journalist. Oh, I, I've been writing about uh, these kind of issues for many years, since I was basically in my 20s out of the University of Wisconsin, and I've been living in New York City, where I was born and raised for many years. And when you say these kind of issues, could you be more specific? My father was one of the people who invented the nuclear power reactor. Oh. And so I grew up around nuclear power reactors. I grew up under, when they were being constructed, often visiting as a child, and I worked in high school, summer jobs on uh, Three Mile Island and many other nuclear power plants. And my father, who's uh, approaching 90, we have dinner every week, and he tells me stories from his uh, storied career many times. So it sounds like you came from a very pro-nuclear background. Well, you know, he grew up in Brooklyn next to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. During World War II era, he came to adulthood and was a little young for the draft, but felt that he had to uh, do his part because he missed the draft. And uh, he worked in the defense industry, usually start beginning with the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yards. Working as a metallurgy, he became enamored with metallurgy. He went to Brooklyn Polytechnic, which is Metro Tech, a part of NYU, and studied uh, chemical engineering. When he left the uh, school, he went on to uh, work for various defense contractors, but became more and more interested in power generation. That seemed to be the future. And there was a lot of openings for young people in the nuclear area because it was just starting out. And he looked at it as a power thing and always felt that he chose power over defense. But I think years later, looking back, it was harder now to see the distinction. But it was a different era. He had some interesting early things in his career, and then he wound up going to Hanford, where he uh, worked on building the emergency core cooling system 
of the Emmet reactor, which was the first dual-use reactor in the United States that made both plutonium and electric energy, and it was the first large-scale nuclear power plant ever built. And he was 30 years old, and nobody knew how to build one. And they pretty much gave him the freedom to do anything he wanted. And he figured out how to build it without much help or assistance. So it sounds like with all of this nuclear background within the family, you would have been raised with a bias towards nuclear and supporting it, or is that not the case? Not the case. Uh, my dad, I just talked to him yesterday, and he said he was never, he always saw nuclear power as a transition to something else in the future. It was never going to be something in and of itself because it's too expensive. It's too expensive to build nuclear power plants. Generating electricity from nuclear power plants is too expensive to use as broadly and widely as some people think it should be used. Uh, the insurance costs and the construction costs and the cost per kilowatt of electricity are prohibitive. Uh, but it, he felt it would have been a transitional time. And you have to remember that in the 1960s, in the United States, economic growth was similar to China today. People were 5 6 7% or more economic growth. It looked like there was going to be a shortage of, of electricity. And it turned out with the oil embargo of the early 1970s, in fact, there was an overproduction of electricity. And ever since the 1970s, the, the United States has declined, actually, per capita energy consumption has been steadily declining, and they're taking apart nuclear power plants and retiring them, and they're taking even uh, taking apart some of the coal plants and retiring them. So, there is not as much need for electricity as there was, as there seemed to be in the 1960s. Let's take this around to your recent investigation of WCS. What led you to this investigation? It was, uh, well, I wrote uh, several stories. I've been writing for whowhatwhy.org, which is a blog site, a news blog site, and uh, had asked me to write, put down some of the things that I've learned in written form. And I wrote an article about, basically in form of my dad's experience building the end reactor in Hanford. That was the first one. And it was pretty much a history of plutonium production in the United States. The second article that I wrote was about the explosion at the waste isolation pilot plant, or as... Secretary Moniz has called it the thermal event in the, <laughs> the kitty. I was warned. I was asked by the New Mexico uh, Environment Department to call it as it was called by the secretary a thermal event and not explosion, having to do a kitty litter. And then the third story, uh, which is really informed more by the fact that I was tracing the, you see, I was writing about the end reactor, and then I realized, well, to write about a reactor, you have to write two things. You have to write about where the waste from the reactor goes, and you have to also write about where the uranium that used to fuel it comes from. My first story was about where the uranium goes, and it actually went to a place in upstate New York, near Buffalo, which had been a center of the Manhattan Project. And there are several, you know, somewhat secret military waste dumps outside of Buffalo, New York, including, you know, if you've ever heard of the story of Love Canal, Yes. Love Canal was sold as a toxic waste dump by a company called Hooker Chemical, but Hooker Chemical, if you look into it, barely exists outside of it as a front of the United States government, and it was not doing chemicals, it was doing nuclear, and there were tons of reports of uniformed men in the middle of the night using army trucks and dumping unlabeled barrels for years in that trench. And the barrels are known to have contained radioactive materials? Well, there was not much of a, because it's so dangerous, nobody will dig in to excavate the dump to find out what's there. So it's a guess what was in those barrels. But the only reason we know about these stories was because the state of New York was going to be given the cost of the cleanup. And so the uh, state assembly at the time had a, did their own investigation, and they actually sent investigators out to Love Canal neighborhood, and they talked to people and asked them to tell stories, old-timers. And these, these depositions and these affidavits are part of a report that barely ever saw the light of day, and if you hammer research enough into the Internet, you'll find it on some website somewhere. You know, it was Stanley Fink, member of the State Assembly in New York State at the time, who did it, and it, it never saw the light of day. 
the report. But I found the report and read it, and it was fascinating to read one after another stories from these old timers who were patriotic Americans who couldn't under really didn't know what was going on. They just said, "How come I saw army trucks backing up to the edge of that canal and guys in uniforms getting out and dumping unlabeled barrels in there night after night after night for years?" Like, there's a lot of things going on. Love Canal was never really investigated. It was never, you know, there's a couple articles were written about it. You don't see any books about it or anything. Very little is known about it. But Three Mile Island, you know, you'd think Three Mile Island was a huge disaster, you know, that was an accident and affected all these people. Look up books. No, no books were re- ever written about it. Very little investigation about Only it. Only one. It was by Mike Gray. And I was one mile from Three Mile Island when it happened. So this has been a particular okay. area of interest of mine. Right, there's very little known, and I know, listen, my dad designed Three Mile Island. He designed Three Mile Island, he designed its its twin, which is over in New Jersey. Which one in New Jersey? Uh, Oyster Creek. See, Three Mile Island 2 was really supposed to be Oyster Creek 2. And uh, the reason it wasn't built was because the construction unions in New Jersey tried to shake down the electric company, GPU, General Public Utilities, and... The, head, the president of the company was a former lieutenant commander in the Navy and top assistant to Admiral Rickover, wasn't the type of man who allowed what he considered mafia New Jersey construction unions to tell him what to do. So he moved the, the reactor to uh, Three Mile Island, and my dad warned him not to do it. You know, he said it's dangerous to do that. It was built for the beach, and you want to move it to a mountain. And he said, you will move it where I tell you to move it. My dad left the industry soon after that. He was going to go through that again. This is all tremendously fascinating and points to at least three other interviews I want to have with you. But let's bring this back around to WCS. The thing is, it's all one big story. It's one big story that traces back to the big nuclear test at Bikini Island in 1946. You know, that's where these guys all started. Okay, but switching the focus for the sake of this program and this interview, let's go into the history of the site as you uncovered it, some of the political pressures that were placed upon the people in the area and why they were placed in order to get this site built in the first place. I talked to people who live in that community, and they were not all in favor of building a waste dump in Andrews, Texas. And some of the people there who were basically... Poor people, oil field, roughneck, you know, descendants and people who worked in the oil fields, uh, you know, m- many would call trash or whatever, you know, and they were good people. They knew the dangers of such a dump in their community and they didn't want it. And they started working against it. But, you know, as soon as Harold C. Simmons purchased the company, which was losing money, then, you know, people like Kent Hans and who was the only person ever to defeat George W. Bush in an election for his Congress, George W. Bush's first time he ran for office, and who is portrayed in the movie W by Oliver Stone, he, you know, became an, a lobbyist for WCS. And once these people got involved, these big money people, and, uh, you know, Harold C. Simmons was the guy who financed the swift boat attack on Kerry, and he was the guy who owned Halliburton, when Dick Cheney was the uh, president of the company, a company that got $40 billion in contracts in Iraq and is, uh, was written about for its, its still mostly top-secret activities in Iraq. He also tried to buy Lockheed, which is at the time the largest defense contractor in the country, but uh, was frustrated in that. And uh, he also bought the National Lead Company, which was accused and sued for lead paint and poisoning children with lead, and whose main lawyer was Gail Norton, who became George W. Bush's secretary of the EPA. You know, there's a $30 billion fund that is uh, collected by the government of many ratepayers, electric ratepayers. If you ever look at your electric bill and wonder what some of those charges that you don't understand at the bottom of your bill are, well, $30 billion from ratepayers and other sources have been collected into a fund to dispose of nuclear waste. And that $30 billion oh. is just waiting for billionaires to make billions more. So that brings it around <laughs> to Harold C. Simmons again. He died I, a couple years ago. Yeah, I and know that, but what year was it that he actually purchased OUCS? Uh, 94, 95, in the mid-90s. And one of the things that we've discovered here at Nuclear Hot State is that 
initially it was shown that WCS was on top of the Oglala Aquifer, but Harold C. Simmons was on the board of Texas Tech, and he went to them to say, why don't you do another geological survey of the aquifer and tell us where it really ends? And when the new maps came out, surprise, surprise, WCS was no longer on top of the aquifer. It was uh, marked as about six miles away. Texas Tech University's chancellor was Kent Hans, who went on to be a lobbyist for uh, WCS. So it's all tied together, and it was in everyone's best interest to fudge it around the edges. The, well, the community people, poor community people who didn't want it, were going to stop it until these people got involved. And then when they would go to the community meetings, all of a sudden there were all these, like, dudes hanging around saying, you know, call them the B word. And as one woman, uh, Melody Pryor, told me, saying things my daddy would have punched them in the nose for saying to a woman. That kind of intimidation. Mm -hmm. And was there a threat of violence, or was there violence, or was it just the presence enough to... Show up at a public meeting. Let's say you, as a woman, show up at a public meeting, and some dude looks at you and says, Hey, bitch. I happen to have a different attitude towards that, because I feel a bitch is a woman who must be doing something right to get somebody <laughs> mad enough to uh, call this her mad. This is what I was told was said. It's an intimidation factor to try and get people to back off for the smallest possible investment of time and energy by the other side. And clearly it worked because the site did come through. They would stand outside the meetings with signs, no bonds for billionaires, and the, the county had an election, and they went to the business people in the county, and they said voting against the bond issue would be bad for business, and the place is already depressed economically, so the business people were afraid. And the election still, the bond, pro-bond people, the pro-WCS people only won by three votes. And yet on WCS literature, they insistently, incessantly say they have unanimous support. Well, of course, they're always going to play around with the wording because that's one of the ways that they create the illusion of what it is that they're doing. So let's move this along. They got their license. They originally were allowed to take the waste only from Texas and Vermont. How did they expand to the point where they're taking the amount of waste that they're taking now? It was a compact between the state of Texas and the state of Vermont. WCS originally didn't take nuclear or radioactive waste or low-level nuclear waste, as they call it. It took PCBs. And a matter of fact, the PCBs came from the Hudson River here in New York. So there's a division going on between environmentalists in the southwest and environmentalists in the northeast. Environmentalists in the northeast want nuclear power plants like Vermont Yankee decommissioned. It's been decommissioned, ripped down, and then its radioactive parts sent to the southwest to be buried. The people in the southwest, you know, many of them, the environmentalists, don't want it there. So there's actually a division between environmentalists in the west and the east on this matter. And it was supposed to be a compact between Texas and Vermont, where Vermont would pay money to Texas in return for Texas taking its waste. The license was constantly upgraded and changed to now WCS is taking radioactive waste from 36 states around the country. And now they're asking to extend their license to accept high-level waste, which is spent nuclear fuel from nuclear reactors, which was supposed to go to the Yucca Flats in Nevada. But Yucca Flats will probably never take it because the senator, Harry Reid, didn't want it in his state, and he put the kibosh on it when he was majority leader. And so they lost that. WIP, Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, another multi-billion dollar highly engineered underground site, who knows when that will ever open after the thermal event that occurred. And uh, so that leaves, there's a couple of other private sites that, are, that can't take as much waste or are being closed down. There's a couple of, like, Richland, Washington, there's a government site, and the people there don't want it up there, so there's fighting about it over there. So that leaves WCS as almost the only site in the country, really, that can take this stuff. And it's a failure of the highly engineered, deep underground facilities that were first proposed and sort of going full circle to just dumping it in a hole in the ground. What do you see as the dangers of the privatization of waste storage? Well, I look to what happened at Rocky Flats, Colorado. 
in Rocky Flats where they were making plutonium pits. Basically, they were making the atom bomb triggers that go inside of a hydrogen bomb. And they discovered there was plutonium going in outside of Denver. And the plutonium was going into the water table, and they were finding plutonium in the water. And that's a violation of law. So the FBI opened up an investigation of a government nuclear plant, and they raided the place in 19, I believe it was 89. And what's very interesting is in that FBI raid, there was fear that the security guards of the private company that ran Rocky Flats at the time would open fire on the FBI agents if they tried to enter this top-secret nuclear facility, which fortunately did not happen. And the uh, the company that ran it, and it's just not coming to the top of my, you know, you can look it up, was fined $20 million, which is the largest fine in American history. And they had to close down Rocky Flats. So a private company running a nuclear weapons or waste disposal site that takes waste from all these different places, I mean, they're thinking in terms of profit. Now, what happens is that even if they do everything right, if it never leaks, if this pit in Andrews, Texas, filled to the brim and capped and covered, then what happens after that is the state of Texas gets it. WCS is absolved of any responsibility from that point on. They can never be sued. Nothing can ever happen to them. And all future expenses, future leaking, which is inevitable, even the, the environmental department in Texas says it's inevitable that it'll leak eventually into the aquifer, or into whatever's underneath. There's water there will uh, be carried by the taxpayers of the state of Texas. This is a stunning array of information, and you've certainly pulled in aspects of this that I did not expect were connected with it. Now that you are on this story with WCS, where are you planning to take it from here? I guess what I'm asking is where's your book, because this is clearly much more complex than a single article can possibly cover. You know, it's, it's, it's an interesting story because in some ways we, we like to demonize and some of these people deserve to be demonized, you know, because they're out for money and they don't care what happens to the people. But others, you know, aren't so bad. I mean, you know, you have to think. Look up into the sky in 1936 and see the Hindenburg flying over Brooklyn with the swastika emblazoned on its tail and not be impressed by the technical abilities of our uh, enemies, you know, and uh, and feel that we have to have you know, weapons to deal with them. As proper as that was, that's what people believed. In the end, it turned out to be wrong, you know. But at the time, people felt that we needed nuclear weapons, you know, or else other people would get them and use them against us. It turned out not to be true. It really didn't turn out to be true. And we then entered this new, brave new world. And somehow we have to deal with it. And I think I agree, you know, my dad was right. It's a transition. Nuclear power was a transition at a time when it looked like there was growth was so fast that there was no way that traditional methods of electricity production could keep up. Those days are over. We don't need it anymore. We're not carrying, you know, six, seven, eight, ten percent growth rates, and it's not going to ever happen again. So it's time to talk about wind and solar and uh, energy conservation and entering a, a world where we don't talk about watts but milliwatts. We don't talk about megawatts, but we just talk about how we can conserve electricity and energy. So we don't need to keep digging up uranium and digging up coal, and we can leave this stuff in the ground. You don't have to frack for gas. I mean, there's, you know, fracking might even be more dangerous than all this radiation. Radiation, most of it, except for some of the really long-lived radionuclides, eventually dissipates. There's some of these chemicals, the PCBs, they never dissipate. They might even be worse. And fracking also releases radium, which turns into radon. It's in the soil, right? As you know from the, from the nitrate story and, and the fact that the uh, uranium is in the, the naturally occurring uranium could be activated by mass agriculture. So then we're talking about mass agriculture, which uses too much energy and too much oil and the form of fertilizers and all these kind of things. Maybe we have to look at the whole way we live on this earth and maybe change the way to a more sustainable future. Given the massive impact of what we're discussing here and the difficulties of it, what actions do you believe would be effective for us to take now, those of us who are motivated to do something, which includes a vast number of the listeners to this show? What would you suggest as the best steps that we could take? I think that what we have to do is become informed. And I think that, unfortunately, science 
and the science of nuclear power and nuclear weapons and radiation and the science of fracking and things like that, and we have to become more intelligent and more educated and know. And we can't be afraid and fear this knowledge. I feel that the American educational system has to be revamped so that people can learn the thing, not learn in terms of what skills they can provide to corporate America, but learn in terms of how they can become thinking uh, citizens and can make proper decisions. We're not teaching people the wrong thing. I'm a teacher. We're just not teaching them the right thing. And it's time to teach people how to be self-actualized people who can self-organize and not just turn them into a roboticons. We're there to do the bidding of whatever the economy of the next generation is. Uh, we have to really start thinking and planning and deciding where we want to go, not just in our country, but the world, because the radioactive waste and pollution and carbon dioxide and all these things don't know borders. They go everywhere. They cross over. So it's a global problem that has to be settled in that way. And we have to surely talk about disarming our nuclear weapons establishment of the United States and Russia. Our threat isn't Iran or North Korea or a country with a half a dozen nuclear bombs. Our threat is the 6,000 bombs held between Russia and the United States, which are capable of dis yet still capable of destroying the world. And we have to get rid of those instead of doing what President Obama and, and the Republicans both together are doing, which is talking about building even more of these things. You know, they, they want to have stockpile uh, stewardship. They want to rebuild and modernize the nuclear armaments. They want to spend a trillion dollars doing that. That is a, a long way to go. Paul, this is fascinating, and I will want to speak with you again. But for now, what is a way for people to follow your work if they wish to read any of the articles you have created or this new one that is going to be published as of – actually, we're, it's going to be published on Monday. We're speaking just before that. The show will be up on Tuesday. They should read this at whowhatwhy.org. And my latest stories, the four, this was the fourth one in a series – are available at whowhatwhy.org. I'm usually under Earth, but you can just search my name, Paul DiRienzo, D-E-R-I-E-N-Z-O. Google me. It's all there. I've been on RT, several shows about this, which is pretty much just talking about what you read in the articles. I think that you'll find that my stuff is pretty easy to find once it's published, so uh, that's the way to get it right now. Wonderful knowing you are yet another resource for us to understand and expand our scope on the nuclear issues. Anything you want to say in closing? It's all connected. Nuclear power and nuclear weapons were founded by the same exact people at the exact time and that the Adams for Peace program that was instituted in 1954 by President Eisenhower was an attempt to try and soften the bad public image of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by saying there was peaceful, progressive ways we could use nuclear power. We're not in the 1950s anymore. It's time to be in a much more inclusive world where we can live at peace with our neighbors. Paul DiRienzo, it was a pleasure to have you as my guest today on Nuclear Hot Seat. Investigative journalist Paul DiRienzo. You can find his nuclear-related articles on the website whowhatwhy.org. Hopefully we'll have Paul back on the show before too long. And if I can just manage to interview his father. Time for another hit of online wisdom and advice from Dave Parrish of Operation Save the Earth. He's back with social media super tricks for activist number seven, Google+. Plus. Hey guys, it's Dave from Operation Save the Earth. And I'm here with part seven of the eight part social media super trick series. Last time we talked about the hidden powers of YouTube. One of the reasons why it's been so successful is because of the company that bought it in 2006, Google. The ubiquitous search engine has evolved over the past 20 years from its inception as a college research project into a multi-billion dollar global interest. From your Android phone to mapping the world, Google has become the leading everything when it comes to the web over the past 20 years. And as the Internet has evolved, so too have Google's algorithms, a.k.a. those search engine spiders I keep talking about. By incorporating an all-of-the-above approach, they've managed to dominate their space despite the controversies. But for all their successes, Google hasn't been able to make a dent in Facebook's status as the number one social media site. 
When Google launched Google Plus in 2011 in a bid to compete, it was met with harsh backlash by Gmail users who felt put upon by being forced into adapting to the new social platform. Google Plus soldiered on, though, and over the past 18 months has finally started to gain traction with an interesting demographic, small business owners. By implementing tools on Google Plus for people to spread relevant and topical information like Google Hangouts, communities, and collections, Google Plus has repurposed the Facebook model for maximum exposure. And since Google loves Google, meaning Google products get priority in their search engine algorithms, what Google Plus affords us especially is unprecedented opportunity to maximize our message in ways that Facebook simply won't. As we covered in Part 3, Facebook not only has a propensity to downplay any trending related to hashtag Fukushima, their algorithms only allow you to see and present only about 2% of what you should. Google Plus is not like that at all. Your reach can literally be 100 times what it is on Facebook with Google Plus. And if you augment your posts with pics and hashtags like we've talked about before, you will literally be serving up an all-you-can-eat buffet for those algorithm spiders. So here's your super trick for the week. If you shunned your Google Plus page before, Give it another look. After years of sucking and not having much reach, new tools and powers have been implemented for you to start trending our message in ways you hadn't imagined before. Google Plus is evolving at a rapid pace these days, and even though it may not sport Facebook's 700 million daily users, we can fill up an awful lot of those 117 billion monthly searches with quality content about the fight for Fukushima. Tune in next week for our eighth and final segment where we tie all the social media elements together. See you next time. That was Dave Parrish of OperationSaveTheEarth.com and our social media guru here on Nuclear Hot Seat. Dave hosts Fuku Friday Happy Hour Hangout every Friday at 4.30 Eastern, 1.30 Pacific on... Strangely enough, Google+. Plus. Activist shout-outs, and this is for everyone. We are up against Ontario Power Generations and the Canadian government's adamant stance that they are going to be building a deep geologic repository for nuclear waste less than one mile away from the shoreline of Lake Huron, one of the Great Lakes. Despite opposition from cities, states, individuals on both sides of the U.S.-Canadian border. They have been pushing this forward and look like they're going to build this come hell or high water, both of which may be happening before too long. To that end, Kevin Camps of Beyond Nuclear last week sent out a comprehensive email, not only putting forth the issue, but all of the links necessary to comment on petitions and people to contact in order to try turning this around. For those of us here in the U.S., one of his strongest suggestions is to contact our two U.S. Senators and our U.S. Representative, which we can contact through the U.S. Capitol switchboard at, write it down, 202-224-3121. What you want to do is urge them to co-sponsor the bipartisan U.S. Senate Bill number 134 and House Bill number 194, which are resolutions opposing the Deep Geologic Repository, the DGR. If they have already done so, thank them. And if they have not, urge them to do so ASAP. Likewise, urge them to co-sponsor U.S. Senate and House legislation, the Stop Nuclear Waste by Our Lakes Act, which is going to be introduced by U.S. Senators Stabenow and Peters, and U.S. Representative Kill D. These are all Democrats from Michigan. Once Congress returns to session on September 8th, the Stop Nuclear Waste by Our Lakes Act will invoke the 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty and mandate the U.S. Canadian International Joint Commission to undertake a comprehensive review of the DGR proposal. 
There are many other excellent suggestions in this email from Beyond Nuclear, which you can find by contacting beyondnuclear.org. And if you can't find it on their website, give them a call or send them an email and say, put me on your mailing list. I want this. It's a good mailing list to be on because their alerts and their information are excellent. And for those of you who probably missed it, last Wednesday at the very last minute, I was called to be a guest for two hours on Ground Zero with Clyde Lewis, which is syndicated on 200 radio stations around the country. We spoke for two hours on all things nuclear, and I have to say he was one of the most professional, well-grounded, and well-informed interviewers I have ever experienced in mainstream media. Once the website is up and running, I will, of course, have it there. But until then, you can access the show at groundzero.org. And the title is Hydros-Fears. Hydros-Fears. Very clever. Just scroll down a couple of beats on there and you will find the link. And I think you will appreciate it. Here's today's final thought. A question that's been bantered about in the past week on Facebook has been whether or not Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who I usually refer to as Abe Baby, but whether he has cancer. Despite one YouTube video reposting of a popular, if over-the-top, radio personality stating that this diagnosis is an absolute fact, there is no verifiable information that he is battling cancer. However, since there was smoke, I decided if I could see any kind of a fire. In part, that's because before this dust-up on Facebook, I'd recently seen a picture of Abe taken on June 8th at the G7, marked down from G8, summit in Germany. In that picture, he appeared puffy, overweight, ashen, drained, and moon-faced. At the time, I posted the rhetorical question, Has Abe been ill? Thanks to my friend and his sister activist, Kathy Iwane, who lived in Japan with her husband until Fukushima happened, and who is fluent in Japanese, I learned that there have been a number of stories in what Kathy labels well-read weekly magazines that point to the possibility of illness. There was a report at npn.co.jp in September of 2014, claiming that Abe was suffering from pancreatic cancer and taking loads of medications, including steroids, with the deleterious side effects like moon face. More recently, Matome Naver published a summary from multiple magazines with stories on Abe's allegedly failing health, and another publication, Real Live Magazine, published its own story. Then just this past week, on August 26th, the weekly magazine Shukan Bunshu published a report that Abe rushed to the bathroom during a meeting on the night of June 30th and vomited blood. The very next day, August 27th, the office of the Prime Minister said that it had sent a letter of protest to Shukan Bunshu for false reporting. Abe's letter criticized the magazine for, quote, an extremely malicious act of slandering by carrying groundless reports and giving a false impression to its readers, end quote, and urged it to retract the article and issue a correction. Abe's office said it is also considering taking legal action against Shukan Bunshun. But according to media reports, Shukan Bunshun's editorial department said what is written in the article is its position and they are standing by it. What we have here so far is a he said, she said situation. But there are a few other points to consider. As regards Abe's physical condition, the weight gain, puffiness, and reported steroid use, I did research that showed that steroids are listed as a common treatment for cancer. And side effects for steroid use can include changes to your face, a swollen or puffy face, known colloquially as having a moon face, increased appetite, which results in weight gain. Steroid use can also lead to changes in mood and behavior. You may feel more anxious and emotional than usual when you take steroids. Just what we want to see in a world leader, eh? So what have we got? some physical symptoms, 
some circumstantial evidence, some suppositions, some overblown claims at the edges of the anti-nuclear movement, and the big question, does Shinzo Abe have cancer? The only accurate answer we have right now is, we don't know. And if, hypothetically speaking, Japan's Prime Minister is suffering from cancer, would it make any difference? Would it change his policies towards Fukushima? Probably not. Towards the restart? He's got too much invested there. Would he be forced to leave office? Doubtful. Until and unless he's either voted out or they pry the positions from his cold, dead fingers. Now, in reporting all of this, do I wish cancer on Shinzo Abe? No. Not on Abe. Not on anyone. So all we have right now is rumor, noise, circumstantial stuff, and curiosity about what is causing Abe's physical, physical symptoms. As for anything else, until it's verified by journalistically acceptable standards, it isn't news. And we'll keep you posted. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, September 1st, 2015. Material from this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, whowhatwhy.org, knexnews.com, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, haidagwaiiobserver.com, U.S. National Library of Medicine, Journal of Occupational Medicine and Toxicology, kxly.com, washingtonpost.com, eturbonews.com, LancasterOnline.com, TheEcologist.org, UCSUSA.org, CancerResearchUK.org, Rocket News, Asahi, NHK, Mainichi, Nature.com, JapanTimes.co, FukuLeaks.org, TheBulletin.org, NuclearNews.net, Beyond Nuclear and Kevin Camps, The Heartsick Scribes at World Nuclear News, Our Friend Iori Mochizuki and FukushimaDiary.com, and the heart six scribes at World Nuclear News, as well as the onward anti-nuclear nonviolent soldiers of the Nuclear Hot Seat community on Facebook, which you are all invited to join. Thanks to listener extraordinaire Chuck Reed for sending me the RT.com clip where I first learned about Paul DiRienzo. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver, accompanied by John Barnard. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on iTunes under podcasts. Our archive is available on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com. Well, it will be when we're repaired. But until then, you can find us on YouTube under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos or on iTunes under podcasts. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you to Google NRC Petition Hormesis, H-O-R-M-E-S-I-S. And when you get that link, go there and make your comments known to the NRC that you do not want them to change the way they evaluate radiation risk from the scientifically proven gold standard no linear threshold model to the junk science theories of radiation is good for you represented by hormesis. And then, remember that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep. Because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking.